With tens of millions of people around the world having now received either their first or second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, we're starting to hear more and more reports of potential severe side effects. In this video, I'm going to cover four of them and discuss what's being done to investigate these further, as well as what their potential link to the vaccine might be. Hi, I'm Dr. Lewis Gren, board certified family medicine physician. Let's get started. Okay, so I'm not gonna cover some of the mild side effects that people are experiencing. If you're interested in a video on those side effects, check out the video I made after my second Moderna vaccine a couple of weeks ago. I'll link it both uh, up above as well as down in the comments below. I am gonna cover though four of the more serious side effects that are being reported and potentially linked to the vaccines. The first one that I'm gonna cover is something called Bell's palsy. What is Bell's palsy? Bell's palsy is a sudden onset of weakness of one side of your face. Currently, Bell's palsy is pretty rare. It happens to about 35 out of 100,000 individuals. Currently, the exact cause of Bell's palsy is unknown. However, we do think it may be caused either by a virus or an inflammatory condition. That's why the more common treatment currently for Bell's palsy is both an antiviral as well as steroids. Now, there has been a report of Bell's palsy happening after receiving the vaccine. In the clinical trials from both Moderna and Pfizer, there were about eight individuals who developed Bell's palsy out of the 73,000 individuals that were involved in the trial. Now, it is true that there were more individuals who received the vaccine that developed Bell's palsy than in the placebo group. However, if you remember the incidents that I described just a few minutes ago, the incident of Bell's palsy during the clinical trials was actually less than the background incidence of Bell's palsy in the general population. Therefore, the current thinking is that the vaccine is not the cause of Bell's palsy, but rather we just experienced a temporal relationship because of the background amount of people who might get Bell's palsy during the trial anyways. Now, the manufacturers are still investigating this as well as the FDA and other government regulating bodies around the world. So stay tuned for this. I haven't seen a lot of reports of this in the post-marketing surveillance, but I did see a lot of it before the vaccine started to be distributed and there was quite a bit of information spread around and even now um, on the internet you still see a lot of people who are concerned about whether or not they're gonna get Bell's palsy after the vaccine. Interestingly enough, in those individuals who did receive the vaccine as well as in the placebo group, the average timing of developing Bell's palsy was actually several weeks after receiving the vaccine. Okay, the next potential side effect we're gonna talk about is something called thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or TTP for short. Now this is a rare condition that causes clumping of the platelets. Platelets are the little pieces of your blood that help you clot whenever you get a cut or something like that. But in this condition, it causes them to clump together, actually leading to a dangerously low level of platelets. So this can increase your risk of bleeding as well as it can cause small little clots to form in your small blood vessels. Many individuals who have TTP actually form what we call purpura, which are little purplish discolorizations on the surface of the skin. Now, if you've been following the news, this is the condition that the doctor in Florida developed after he received his vaccine. There have actually been 35 cases reported since we started mass vaccinations around the world by the end of January. Still very rare if you consider that we've vaccinated millions and millions of people, but it does bear watching and surveilling to see if we do develop a causal relationship with this condition. We do know that this condition has been caused by other vaccines, such as the MMR vaccine and others that we give routinely. So this isn't completely unexpected that we might see this, but it's important to keep in mind that this is extremely rare. Next, we're gonna talk about anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction that can develop after your body is exposed to just about anything. Most people are familiar with anaphylaxis, whether it's anaphylaxis to uh, a food 
or a medication, or in this case, a vaccine, I don't think anyone is disputing whether anaphylaxis has occurred as a result of this vaccine. We knew it would happen. However, what I think is reassuring is that it has not occurred in a large amount. That's because these vaccines actually have very few components to them. Now, it is currently felt that those that are developing an anaphylactic reaction are doing so to either the polyethylene glycol or the glycosorbate components that are contained in the vaccine. Polyethylene glycol is actually a very common uh, compound that's found in a lot of laxatives. I think it's important though to put the anaphylaxis rate with the COVID-19 vaccines in perspective to something much more common, say, like penicillin. The anaphylaxis rate currently being experienced by those receiving either COVID-19 vaccine is approximately two and a half to 4.7 cases per million doses. Now let's put that in perspective. Let's use penicillin as an example. The anaphylaxis rate for penicillin is approximately 200 cases per million doses. So I say that just so that we can actually have a comparison that a lot of people are familiar with and hopefully reassure you that the incidence of anaphylaxis with these vaccines is actually quite low. And again, that's because there's actually quite few components in those vaccines, a lipid nanoparticle, the messenger RNA, and a couple other components like the polyethylene glycol. Very clean vaccines. There's not even any adjuvants in these vaccines that could potentially cause reactions. Now, if you're somebody who experiences allergic reactions to other components or to other vaccines or other medications, it is recommended that you consult your physician before taking the vaccine. And this is also the reason that individuals are monitored for a minimum of 15 minutes after receiving the vaccine, even those who have never had an allergic reaction to a vaccine or a medication. If you're someone who's had an allergic reaction, you should actually stick around for at least 30 minutes. And when you're deciding where to get vaccinated at, you should make sure that the vaccination site is equipped with medical personnel as well as equipment to deal with an allergic reaction should one occur. The final condition we're gonna talk about is death. That's a pretty big one. There have also been several highly publicized articles about people dying after getting the vaccines. Now, I think we have to put this one in perspective as well, because again, to date, none of these deaths have been definitively linked to the vaccine. What they've been linked to is a causal relationship to somebody getting the vaccine but then happening to die afterwards. Most of the deaths that have been reported have been persons 70 years or above. They've also been in persons who have had chronic medical conditions, either in nursing homes or with several chronic conditions that already predispose them to sudden death. So I think that's important to keep in mind as you're deciding whether or not to take the vaccine. All of the deaths that have been reported as potentially caused by the vaccine have been or are under investigation, and certainly if there is a causal link found that will be reported, but I think it's important to understand as of today, there has been no definitive evidence to say that the vaccines have caused anybody to die. And I know there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there who would argue against that. I would encourage anybody who does so to back it up with facts, because to date there aren't any. I'm not gonna sit here and say that there are no risks to getting the vaccine. Please don't hear me saying that. Everything we do in medicine is about risks and benefits. I use a joke with my patients that there's risk to drinking the water, but there's also risk to not drinking the water. Everything we do in medicine is a balance of risks and benefits. In this case, what's the risk of getting the vaccine? What's the benefit of getting the vaccine? versus what's the risk to you as an individual of getting COVID and what's the potential consequences of getting COVID, including death from COVID. We can't forget that a lot of people, over 400,000 people have died from COVID. We also can't forget the long-term consequences that we're seeing in people who have had long COVID with the chronic fatigue, chronic loss of taste and smell, chronic 
cough, chronic trouble breathing, etc. So I know a lot of people will trumpet that COVID is a mild illness, many people recover and don't have any long-term consequences. And thankfully that's true, but there are also many people out there who don't. So again, for you, when it comes to decide whether or not you're gonna get the vaccine, please be informed and do your own calculation of risks and benefits. Okay, that's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you'll consider subscribing to my channel for more videos in the future. Hit that like button. It does help other people see the videos. And let me know if you have any questions or comments down below. And remember, as always, be safe out there.